Welcome to the RV Podcast, episode 407. And this week, we've got some very important RV travel and safety tips. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Wendland and this is my lifelong traveling companion and my bride, Jennifer, and we're delighted to have you with us on the podcast this week. We've been busy. We're yeah. always busy. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're usually busy and we're going to be busy this week like normal because we're going to go to Elkhart and pick up our Arcadia fifth wheel because we had some upgrades done on it. We're really excited about some of the upgrades. I guess we can share the details. We've had uh, had it maxed out for solar. We've replaced the six, well, we've added to the 600 watts of solar on the roof. We now have 1200 watts on the roof. And to the 300 amps of lithium batteries, we now have 600 amp hours of lithium batteries. So that's gonna help us with boondocking in that fifth wheel. We're pretty excited about that. But there's been a whole bunch of other things. We've added some stabilization features for the very front of the RV and for the very rear of the RV, in addition to the four uh, automatic leveling jacks that we have. That's going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And a couple of other neat things uh, that have to do with the door and some, some stuff there. But I think what's really excited me is uh, we're going to be um, doing some remodeling on the inside of it to kind of make an office uh, production area for us when we do our videos. Yeah, we're going to have a, a desk installed where the table and the bench are right now. Yep, and a couple of, of, um, of, of real chairs that are, are more suited to sitting down and working. But it'll still double as a... Uh, as a table. As a table, it's a dining table. And it's all being done by uh, Courtney Armstrong, who many of you know, Courtney hosts uh, a big uh, web platform called The Flippin' Nomad. She specializes in upgrading and, uh, and doing remodels and customizing uh, interiors of RVs. And uh, we were with her recently at Elkhart and asked her some ideas and uh, she and her mom, Patty, are gonna, gonna be doing those for them and we'll be seeing that on Friday. You'll get an idea of it all. We'll have it all set up for you and it will uh, it will look great. So It's gonna be fun. Yeah, I am really excited about it and I can't wait to, uh, to really see it. So uh, that'll be Friday. And then, and then we head to Linden, uh, in Linden, Tennessee, I should say, to work on our RV property down there. Yeah, we've got uh, the electricity pretty much in. I think it'll be all set when we get down there. And we've got some some projects to do and we'll be hanging out at, uh, at the Woodlands. We have a name for the property now. We named our property and uh, we'll share the name with you in a, in a future video, but that's gonna be fun. Uh, but first, before we go to Elkhart, before we go to Linden, we're going to Holland, Michigan. Actually, as we record this, we're going on uh, Tuesday, uh, the day before this podcast is released. We are going to uh, Turn, let go of our wonder. Yeah, it's kind of a bittersweet moment, but it's also uh, shrouded in anticipation of what's to come. Um, so we are going to be selling our wonder and we've decided we'll sell it through Holland Motor uh, Homes. We'll put some contact information if you want to check that out. I mean, our wonder is pretty well known from the channel, <laughs> and I, and we've had lots of people say, "Hey, we want to buy it." So, but it's all going to be handled by Brad Bohr over there at Holland, and uh, we're taking it there tomorrow. We've spent the weekend kind of getting stuff out of it, and we're kind of sad to do that because we really love it's that. It's hard unit. to say goodbye, but. Fun to think of the other, and then I'll go through withdrawal that we don't have a class B plus or C, whatever you want to call it, to, uh, next to our house. Yeah, uh, well, we're going to be for a few a, weeks. We're going to be traveling a lot, and we'll be in the fifth wheel for a while. Mm -hmm. The fifth wheel, as you know, is going to be kind of like our base camp down in Tennessee, and maybe when we go to different places where we want to stay a little longer. But we'll get to and from with the uh, with the class C motorhome, but we won't be class C motorhome less for a long time, very long time, because uh, mid-September, we are picking up our brand new Unity FX from Lisa Travel Vans. 
we ordered that uh, just about the time we got the uh, the wonder. We said, well, we know what we're going to want. We knew it was going to take a while. So it's been almost almost two years we've had this order in. And uh, we just got word that it will be done uh, in mid-September. So stay with us. We'll tell you all about that, too. So everybody who wants to see our new rig will be able to see it. That's right. That's right. Uh, all right, we got some uh, news that we want to share this week. And then um, after a break, we've got all sorts of information about safety and travel tips that you're going to want to listen to, very relevant to, uh, to the RV lifestyle. But uh, let's check in with one of the bigger stories, and uh, that has to do with gas prices. Right. We've got some good news about gas prices. For the sixth week in a row, uh, they're dropping, and the average is four twenty-two a gallon nationally. And in some parts, of course, you know, some parts of the country like California, Oregon, Washington, Illinois, and Maine, the prices are about $5.61 per gallon, wow. whereas in other states such as Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma, they're reporting gas prices of uh, $3.72 per gallon. And uh, new report states some of the uh, price dropping is uh, due to Americans are changing their driving habits. Now, this is the sad part because many are driving less, canceling vacations. The good part is uh, combining errands and uh, being wise with how they use their gas, you know, carpooling, things like that. Those are all good, but canceling vacations and not seeing grandma and grandpa, those are bad. <laughs> Very important Very to bad. see grandma and grandpa. Let me just point <laughs> that out. Uh, but that's good news that the prices are down and everybody wants to yell and complain, but you know, they're coming down again. So. I don't know how long it'll it'll go down, or how low, or how long, but that's good. Uh, interesting story this week. If you are outside, if you are camping, or even if you can get to a place with with dark skies, this is the the time of the year we have the annual Perside meteor shower. The peak is coming as this is being released on August third. The peak is coming in about a week on uh, August 10th uh, is when they expect it really to kind of peak. August 10th, 11th, 12th, right in that time period. Um, one of our favorite things is looking up at the stars. Mm -hmm. We just love to do that. That's one of the big draws of camping. We That's why we like to boondock, get away from you know everybody with those ridiculous patio lights and flashing <laughs> you know, disco <laughs> lights. Flamingos. Out. And you know, I mean, it's all fun in trees. the campground. I mean, it's all fun. But... but we just love being in the middle of the wilderness with no lights. It's one of the reasons we bought that RV property in Tennessee. Uh, so this is an annual meteor shower, um, and it happens every summer as the Earth uh, passes by this comet called Swift's Tuttle. And uh, some people have been noticing more and more. They started showing up in the sky about July 17th, and they'll continue to the 24th. But again, the highlight is August 11th through the 12th. And uh, when you say the highlight, that means that you might be able to see as many as 150 to 200 falling stars every hour on a clear night. So check it out. August 11th, 12th, you want to be up camping someplace. Uh-huh. Someplace where it's dark. Yeah. Very dark. And uh, if you're planning on boondocking in California's Big Sur, make sure you uh, stick to a designated campsite or you may face a very expensive fine. Monterey County is cracking down on illegal camping along this California epic stretch of Highway 1. And now illegal campers can face fines from $200 to $1,000 per day. $1,000 a day. Effective immediately. But it's been a real problem there. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. Illegal places to camp now include 72 miles of Highway 1 in the Big Sur area, along with three and a half miles along any side road maintained by the county. Officials hope that this is going to stop people from boondocking illegally in the area. Yeah, you know, that's been one of the more popular ones as boondocking has taken off. Uh, and um, and there's these homeless with barely functional RVs that have been camped out there as well. So, But anyway, um, the glory days of camping boondocking along Highway 1 in California are over oh, uh, for well, many. That's sad. Yeah, it's such a beautiful stretch mm -hmm. of road. All right, when we come back, RV safety tips and travel tips that you're not going to want to miss. So stay with us. Tired of overcrowded campgrounds, competing for reservations, paying high fees for sites? Well, ownership is an emerging trend in RVing that might be right for you. 
It sure was for us. Jennifer and I bought some land just west of Nashville, Tennessee, in an incredible collection of mountaintop RV properties called the Woodlands at Buffalo River. These are 5 to 62 acre properties that allow RVs year-round starting at $79,900. We loved it. The scenery is breathtaking and you own it outright. It's not a timeshare. It's your property, your way. You can landscape, garden, bring your pets, build what you want to build. There's high-speed internet available and it is so private. It's a great place to make your home base. No more calling around for reservations and it's ready whenever you want. They're selling these on September 3rd by appointments. Five to 62 acres from $79,900. There's financing and big discounts on multi-lot packages. For information, visit rvlakes.com. That's rvlakes.com. When we're asked what's the most important modification we made to our RV, it's an easy answer. Battleborn batteries. Battleborn batteries are quality, safe, reliable lithium batteries that allow us to stay out there off the grid longer. Lithium batteries charge faster, they charge fuller, they're longer lasting, they're maintenance free. And battleborn batteries are protected by a 10 year guarantee. Now, in our case, they just dropped into the existing AGM batteries that we have. And they'll probably be the same on your rig, too. Battleborn battery experts can get those in your rig just like they did with ours. They can also match you up with the right cabling, the inverter, the charger, the solar controller, everything. Jennifer and I swear by our Battleborn batteries. They allow us to boondock off the grid. Check them out. Go to rvlifestyle.com slash lithium rvlifestyle.com slash lithium. Welcome back, everybody. It's time now for the uh, feedback of the week. This is feedback we've received from all of our various platforms, from Facebook, from YouTube, from the rvlifestyle.com blog, uh, and from direct email. Speaking of which, if you want to reach us and send us feedback, our personal email address, the one to use for us, is Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. That's for Followers of the show, that's not for people who are trying to pitch us stuff and ideas <laughs> and get rich quick scream, schemes and all that. That's just for you who have feedback or questions to give it. So we love to get it. Uh, we got several, and uh, I think you're going to find this interesting. So you want to start off with the first one? Okay, I'm going to talk about Tamara. She sent us this, and she says, Hello, I wanted to see if you wanted to use our story to help others, and we certainly do. We were in a bad accident Friday night, 25 miles from our home in Port St. Lucie, Florida. Mm. We were traveling on the Florida Turnpike when a car traveling at a high rate of speed, at least 100 miles per hour, decided to go between us and a delivery truck. I can see somebody trying to do that. Mind you, this is two lanes. Mm. As they flew past us, the excessive amount of air movement caused us to start to sway. We were uh, traveling between 60 and 65 miles per hour when this happened. This caused us to lose control, hit the guardrail, and then fishtail back and forth on the road. At one point, my wife was parallel to the road as we were almost laying on the uh, driver's side. We ended up on the far right side of the ditch. The camper never came off the truck, but the camper rolled and ended up in two sections. <clears throat> Excuse me. The camper finally came off of the ball uh, a small amount once we came to a stop. Big black wheels elevated a good three feet or so in the air. The point of all this is that the police officer and the tow truck drivers both said if we had not had our sway bars on, we would not have walked away from this accident. It's by the grace of God that we did walk away. I would like to just share so that others use their sway bars as well. I see so many traveling without them. I'll share the pictures and feel free to use them as well if you'd like to share our story. If not, it's okay. Just make sure you use those sway bars. Have a blessed day. Well, Tamara did send us some photos. Uh, those watching the video version of this on YouTube will have seen those photos over uh, part of the information Jen was just sharing from her. 
Um, just a sad story. Thank goodness they weren't hurt. And, yes. and really the importance. One, one thing I note, uh, Tim Miller calls the, uh, the RV a camper. And it was a towable trailer. A camper genuinely, and I don't know, people have, more and more people are calling uh, trailers campers. But they're really not. A camper is something that goes on top of a truck bed, you know. Uh, so it's a trailer. It's a it's a trailer that flipped over like that, and it, and those sway bars. I'm amazed how many people don't have them or use them. So, just a really great point that she makes. And thank you for sharing that and the photos. And I know that'll help others. All right, here's another uh, piece of feedback that came in. This is from Scott and Sarah, and uh, it's a travel tip really about a very popular destination. Listen up. It says, uh, hi, Mike and Jennifer. This is Scott and Sarah from California. We just got back from a month-long RV trip with our family where our destination was Glacier National Park. It was absolutely incredible. There were a few challenges that we faced, and I thought maybe it would be good for the RV community to know how to get around these challenges at Glacier. First of all, they are requiring a timed entrance for your vehicle. They are giving these away every day at 8 a.m., and there are only 151 spots available. From what I understand, there's about 1,500 people trying to get these spots every day. Also, I heard that there are travel agencies that are swooping in and grabbing a ton of those spots. Because of this, we were there for a week and were never able to get an entry for our vehicle. But all was not lost. We found a way around it. If you're in Glacier, and you don't get a vehicle pass, this is what you do. First of all, you can go to the park before 6 a.m. and be there all day. <laughs> Second of all, you can also go into the park after 4, before, after 4 p.m. and stay as long as you want. Montana right now does not get dark until about 10.30, so that gives you plenty of time to enjoy the going to the Sun Road or any of the hiking trails. Uh, there's one more way around it. If you get yourself a reservation for anything, then you can go in during the day. So you might make a reservation for a boat ride, a kayak rental, any kind of tour. Even though we were never able to get a reservation for our car, we were still able to do everything we wanted to do by using these different techniques. So get that. If you get there before 6, you can go in. And if you get there after 4, you can go in without the timed permit. And if you make a reservation for something, you can get in. Just a great tip from Sat and Sarah, because um, you know these parks are so popular. And as she said, we've heard this from others that commercial operators are running in and they're getting all the entry passes as many as they can, um, you know, for their paying customers. And uh, I, I think Scott and Sarah gave us some great tips. Give us great advice. That just seems like they wouldn't let travel agents go in and do that. Yeah. With only 151 spots available. All right. Now we have something from uh, Dave from Waterford, Michigan, who uh, wanted to share the kindness of other RVers when he and his wife suffered a breakdown on the road. My wife and I purchased our first travel trailer about a year ago. I have been learning a ton from your website and podcast during the last year. We took our first real trip last week to the Leelanau Peninsula. We had a great time until our truck broke down on the trip home just outside Traverse City. We were forced to have our truck towed to a dealer. We were not sure exactly what we were going to do with our trailer that was sitting on the shoulder of M72. While we waited for the tow truck, we had four different groups of people stop, all campers, and offer to help us. Wow. One couple offered and we agreed to allow them to tow our trailer to a nearby casino parking lot while we dealt with the truck. The breakdown was definitely frustrating, but the kindness of all of the campers that offered to help made a bad situation much better. Thank you all for all the advice and all the help yeah. that we all give each other, help each other. Isn't that great? You yes. Know, these are such ridiculous times with everybody at each other's throats and just arguing and fighting over everything. There's still a lot of kindness out there, and thank goodness for... Uh, uh, for that, and I really appreciate uh, uh, Dave sharing that with us. That yeah, was, I do too, because was... all of us were grateful that it's not our car, truck, or our whatever broken down, and a lot of us have been there broken down, 
Oh, and gosh. we want to help others. So frustrating. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to whoever those people were, um, campers, fellow campers. Yeah, four different groups. There's good people out there. There are yeah, good people. Good. Well, lastly, we received some video feedback and then a very important tip related it from uh, one of our uh, followers and her husband. Uh, Joanne is her name. And with her husband, John, they were with us at the Elkhart Encounter, the gathering we just held in Indiana. Uh, and while there, in the middle of the, I think our first night, John suffered a medical emergency. And uh, we, in fact, we asked for a doctor, if there was a doctor, and we had a doctor and a nurse that came up. And, and uh, the advice of both was, you know, uh, for the symptoms, he had to go to the emergency room in a hospital right away. Well, they did, and it was a good thing they did. Uh, they stayed there for, I think, 48 hours. Uh, but it and John was released and he's doing great but this now presented them with a real dilemma so uh, because John was told not specifically not to drive for several days uh, until he saw his own doctor and they they got on a, a prescribed regimen so there they are uh, 500 miles from home with their RV the event comes to an end they got there at the last day when we had driving school and um, Joanne sent us first this video report uh, to offer uh, uh, her kind of accounting of what happened and some very important advice and how she solved the dilemma that she was in. Let's listen to Joanne as she shared this. Hey, Mike. Well, as you well know, we had a medical emergency and I did not know how to drive the RV. And I'm hoping that this uh, video will encourage those who may not know how to drive to go ahead and do it. We were at the Elkhart meetup. Thank heavens there was an MD in the audience that told us to go to ER right away. Phyllis drove us, and 42 hours later when John was discharged, and by the way, he's doing great, um, we went back to the very last session of the meetup, which was driving school. <laughs> what luck was that? And I even got a private lesson from Courtney. Um, we made it back home safely. I am now an RV driver, and uh, I just want to encourage all those ride-alongs who have not learned to drive yet, don't wait for the predicament that we got into. Learn to drive the RV in case of an emergency. Odds are you're not going to end up having it happen at an RV lifestyle meetup where there's all kinds of help. Thanks, Mike. Have a good day. Now, the Courtney, our friend Joanne refers to, is our friend uh, Courtney Armstrong, otherwise known as the Flippin' Nomad. <laughs> Courtney specializes in designing and customizing RV interiors. She's the one that's doing ours right now in Elkhart that we're going to pick up Friday. And we'll link to her site in the show notes. She's got a course that you can take, by the way, online on how and what, what you need to know and if you want to change out your interior and upgrade it. Uh, we'll put a link to that. But... Uh, she did really help out uh, Joanne a lot. And we're going to have a whole video about Courtney on our RV Lifestyle YouTube channel in a couple of weeks. But in Elkhart, Courtney was the instructor of the RV driving school that we offered, and Joanne took it and was able to drive her RV home with confidence. And after she sent us that video report uh, uh, that you guys just heard, uh, she also sent along some written tips that we want to put in the show notes for this episode that have to do with first-time drivers. There's a lot of drivers out there uh, who are sole drivers. They're the only ones. Maybe it's a husband and wife typically, and the husband does all the driving and the wife doesn't. And that's just not a good idea because what happened to Joanne and John could happen to anybody. You both need to know how to, how to drive. So um, in doing so, uh, Joanne sent some tips about what she learned and from whom uh, during driving school and at the event. From Courtney Armstrong, the flippin' nomad. I don't think most people know this. Courtney said, well, number one, set the side mirrors so that they show one third of your rig and two thirds of the lane next to you. If you have separate bottom mirrors, set those so they show your tire on the ground. That's important, so you can see that at any time as you're, as you're driving. Next, uh, always bear in mind, it's going to take far longer for your rig than your personal car to stop because the rig you know, has all that momentum because of its weight. So you need to go slightly under the speed limit until you are very comfortable. 
not so slow that you you're are a nuisance. That you're a road hazard or a nuisance, but slow enough to get stopped. And always allow as much distance as you can behind the vehicle ahead of you. Of course, others are going to cut in, but on that uh, very first drive, you need to be critically observant of what is going on in front of you, beside you, so they have time to react. And take a break, get out and walk every hour, and loosen up those muscles, relax. Yep. Uh, from Mike, she learned. In the beginning, uh, let merging traffic figure out how to merge in with you. Don't try to maneuver your driving to make it easier on them. And, and that's one of the things that I've had to really concentrate on because, you know, when we're towing the fifth wheel, we're usually in the right-hand lane where you should be, and you see, uh, uh, you see, uh, you know, a um, uh, merging uh, intersection coming up on the freeway. Well, in the in just the motorhome, it's it's or even a truck or whatever it is, it's easy to pull over. But when you're towing all that right behind you, you don't want to be weaving in and across lanes. So, if you're in that lane, it is up to the people merging to adjust their speed to either go fast ahead of you or to wait until you've passed and then come in. It's up to them legally. That's their responsibility. Your job is to stay safe. And I think that's I don't a great think people tip. know that. Well, when people know merging, it, but they're just rude. Uh, yeah. I mean, you got to really step on it and get ahead or slow down and get behind. It's not for the other person to get out of the way so you can come in. Yeah. So so that is, uh, that's a, an important thing. Mm -hmm. um, on another uh, tip, she said that uh, on four lane roads or even more, five, six, seven in some big cities, stay in the right lane. If you're passing through a major city, you might want to go one lane to the left if there's multiple lanes there to avoid the constant Passive, oncoming and, and exiting traffic. But uh, do that. And as you're driving, just stay confident. You, you can do this. Um, then, there, then she got some advice from uh, one of are our we, members there. Yeah, a retired uh, psychiatrist. Named Jill. Jill Fox yeah, is her name. Yeah, yeah. and uh, at the Elkhorn encounter, encounter attendee. And she followed this advice. Say over and over, I got this. You know, there is There's power something. in positive thinking. Yep. I got this. You, you, those of you who have gone through personal coaching or business coaching, you know the power of affirmations. And uh, I mean, negative thoughts have power. Have power. They, they can bring you down. So I got this. I got this. And that was just great advice. And it really boosted Joanne up at the, yes. at the game. Like, when I saw Joanne, after she had taken that course, and gotten some advice. She was just so confident. She was two inches taller. Two, she was. <laughs> and uh, and, a, and the, the day before, she was like a nervous wreck. So that's good. And then uh, from Joanne herself, what yeah. she learned in actually following through with these tips. So after driving the 500 mile drive, she learned it was easier on interstates than state highways or back roads, wider lanes, less constant traffic. And Joanne liked going through major cities at rush hour, then people are driving not quite so fast. You're like 35, <laughs> 45 versus 65, 70, how about 90? Yeah. And uh, when I moved one lane to the left, I avoided entering the uh, and exiting, you know, the vehicles, which move yep. over a little bit. She got away from everybody coming and going. And most importantly, don't wait till you have an emergency like Joanne did. Learn now. All right, both of you, uh, drive. Both of you know how to do it, and uh, you'll be much happier that way and, and confident. Now, there are, if, if it's not, if something bad happens to you, there are all sorts of ways to get help. One of the things we recommend is uh, a membership in the FMCA, the, the um, uh, RV uh, group, FMCA. They have a really good program with their membership that includes someone actually driving your RV home in a medical emergency. Uh, check that out. I think Escapees has kind of a similar problem. Those are, are, are similar program. program. Um, and then we've got links on rvlifestyle.com. You can just search for RV clubs and you can find uh, all the different ways you can do it. But learn, both of you learn how to drive. That's good. So we thank Joanne and all the other people who shared that feedback. We want your feedback. Uh, we love getting it. And the way to get it is to send it to us, Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com. When we return, the questions of the week. And we got a bunch of good ones for you this week. Stay with us. When we're on a road trip, we always seem to find a way to stop at a Camping World Center. 
There are over 225 Camping World locations across the country, and there's always one close by when we need parts and accessories for our RV or just want to shop. In fact, uh, we have so much fun with uh, Camping World, and as we talk about it as one of our sponsors, they have agreed to offer a 10% discount if you use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you buy $99 or more in merchandise. You'll find everything you want from outdoor furniture and appliances, the ones you see us use in our videos and that we talk about here in the podcast. RV extras that include everything from camping chairs to fire pits, electrical accessories, must-have gadgets. Check them all out. And again, don't forget, use the coupon code RVLIFESTYLE10 when you visit CampingWorld.com. Welcome back, everybody. Time now for the RV Lifestyle Questions of the Week. We want your questions. Again, use our uh, personal email, Mike and Jen at RVLifestyle.com, and uh, we'll do the best to answer them on the podcast. You want to start off? Okay, we're starting out with a question from Robert. He says, I'm new to the RV lifestyle. Was wondering when storing my RV for a few weeks in between outings, should I leave my black tank empty or full with clean, treated water? Um, that's a great question. It's and there's some question. controversy about it, but I'll give you our best advice uh, based on our 10 years of doing this lifestyle. First of all, of course, you should never store or leave your RV for more than a week with junk in that black tank. Even whether if you're camping, you want to empty it. Even if you're not full and you're, you know, you want to empty it. You don't want to leave that stuff in there. But if you bring it in for storage, you know, you've dumped your black tank, and um, you know it should be emptied. By the way, when it's two thirds full, let it get at least two full. So put a lot more water in there so it gets up to that two thirds level when you dump it, because the water helps flush everything out. Uh, now, um, many RVers, when they put their RV in storage, they dump the black tank and they just leave it like that. And they're okay, and particularly those who are putting it away for the winter time because any liquid, any gunk in that tank, uh, if they're in a cold climate, would freeze. But um, no matter how much you empty that black tank, unless you flush it out with uh, a high pressure wand, they have those cleaners that you can use, or what they call a flusher. Uh, I think Sani Flush is, a, is an optional feature many people have on their sanitation systems. Unless you, you, you use one of those things, those tanks are gonna still have, that black tank is still gonna have some residual matter in it, some very unpleasant residual matter. Now, if it's empty and you're putting it in storage for a while, it will likely dry and it will leave a coating on the walls, on the sensors, the bottom of the tank, and it will stink. Um, so after the black tank has been dumped and it's relatively empty of waste, uh, it's my recommendation that you store your RV with a black tank full of fresh water and treat it with a high quality product that fights bacteria and and uh, has enzyme eating things in their chemicals. Um, two products that we recommend, and we'll link to them in the show notes. Happy Camper, we've been using that for years and are very happy with it. Um, RV Digest It is another product. Happy Camper, RV Digest It. Now I wanna give you one caution about Happy Camper. Uh, if you have a macerator system, as many Class Bs and some Class Cs have, uh, using a lot of Happy Camper uh, and letting it just sit there for a long time, uh, if it doesn't have a lot of water in it, 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 it may not fully dissolve. You want it fully dissolved. So uh, make sure you have a lot of water in there. Because if it's not fully dissolved, if you're putting it in with just a little bit of water, it could cake and become pretty hard. And then that could clog up potentially your macerator. It hasn't happened to us. We've used it with macerator systems. But I want you just to be a little aware of how important um, water is. And just go back last week to last week's episode. Listen to our interview with the RV proctologist who is an expert at this. Uh, uh, you'll love that interview. Have not heard it. It's uh, episode 406. You can find it at rvlifestyle.com slash podcast. Listen to that if you've got any, any questions about black tank. But in general, um, you want to uh, leave that black tank with some liquid in it and well-dissolved chemical treatment. 
Boy, could we have used this information when we first started out with our used Class B. I mean, we bought that little thing, and I said, I'm camping in a vault toilet. Yeah, it <laughs> the stunk. smell of it, it just it smelled wasn't... like crazy. We kept trying to fix it. <laughs> and it was stranger stink, <laughs> which makes it even worse. Well, Remember no, one the thing was, before I us. remember we were yeah. in Indianapolis at this big thing. We kept asking everybody, what are we doing? Yeah, what it can't be us. We just got like, this. Oh, my, we're going to have to camp in this. I uh, called we, it an outhouse. Yeah, <laughs> what did it smell like? And so that's why, yeah. you know, Happy Camper, RV Digest, you, some of this stuff, you know, some of these chemicals you get just mask it with perfume and it smells just terrible. So sweet, sticky smell. You don't want that. Happy Camper, RV Digest it. There'll be links on the pod or on the show notes. Um, all right, um, another question. I know, we've got a question from Jim and Pam and they're planning to tow a 20 foot, 23 foot travel trailer with a half ton pickup truck starting in 23. Planning ahead. Uh, let's see. They're thanking us for all that we do. Uh, we are questioning what practical use and experiences you've had with ham radio when yeah. you're out there camping. And the on-the-move lifestyle, as yeah. you said. So. Um, amateur radio, ham radio requires a license. Many of you know this. Uh, we get this question really almost weekly about ham radio. And I've been a ham radio operator for over a half a century uh, and so I think that's why he's writing. But let's, let's set the scene more because he asks a number of specific questions. He says, for example, beyond the usual benefits that ham radio brings uh, to sticks and bricks living, where you're having a lot of fun and, and it's a hobby. Um, I'll show you, that's, that's my system over there. I don't know if you can quite see it, but I keep, that's my home system, which we have, and it's nice. But um, ham radio on the road is what he's talking about. So he says, we've been thinking to outfit our truck with mobile VHF 2 meter and UHF 70 centimeter and carrying two dual band HTs. This would be like one of these. This is, for those of you watching on YouTube, this is like a ham radio HT, a handy talk it stands for. More specifically, he says, do you find it useful having ham radio in the RV, in the RV or in the, in the tow vehicle? Do you find it useful for mining tips from locals coming into a new area, or do you find it more efficient, uh, a more efficient use of time to simply rely on traditional RV planning tools, including internet searches and reviews, phone app info, and word of mouth in the new area? For example, tips for shopping, hairdresser recommendations, walk-in health clinics, chiropractic help, finding mechanics for servicing, uh, where the locals go, uh, do local rag chews, uh, that's what they call conversations back on ham radio uh, yield mostly spotty results are the best only if you spend more time working the ham bands it is usually worth a try but lower expectations except when suburbia uh, would it be better to just rely on ham radio for caravanning opportunities when people are behind you or is a good cell phone alternative uh, and I'm going to answer this and I'm going to make a lot of ham radio operators angry at me but I'm speaking to you as a person who has loved this hobby and has been in it for 50 years. It's pretty much useless on, as a mobile communications tool anymore, other than for hobby purposes. Uh, I like it. I, I do have it in, uh, in all of our RVs. I'm debating whether I'm going to put it in the truck now that hauls our fifth wheel when we use that. But it's not very practical. Uh, the hobby is so diverse. There's so many different facets that you can take. It isn't like it used to be on two meters where uh, there was always somebody on the national calling frequency of 146.52. It's just, and then when you do get people, they just are chatting about what I had for dinner tonight or very... And there's you know. nothing wrong with that. No, there's it's awesome. A lot but of it's, folks it, know each other. And but if you have it for, you want to know information about what's going on, on the road, um, you know, where to get off and what to see in the town, it's not going to help you there. It really isn't. You do much better with traditional RV planning. So I just have to say that, and you can, we have it on. I like to listen to it. I have a way, a, one of my digital devices, I can listen to my local repeater in Michigan, wherever I am in the country. But it's the same guys talking about usually the same things. And I like it. I mean, I like kind of, but it's noise that Jennifer doesn't appreciate as we're driving. Now, both Jim and his wife Pam are ham operators, so maybe so they, they would, would love it. you might love it. 
I just don't think that it's a very practical thing to have uh, in terms of direction and road awareness. For just having fun, listening in the hobby, sure, go for it. Just like listening to a book or something else. But um, cell phones are much you know, more reliable in terms of being able to get emergency help out there. Yes, ham radio has its place and it is great for emergency communications, but I'm not a big, uh, I gotta say 10 years of doing this, it's not really very practical or useful. Uh, I love the hobby. Don't yell at me ham radio operators, but I'm just trying to give some great advice here. All right, enough All of right, that. Now we got from Jim and Pam from Illinois. That's who asked that question. Okay, that was the question before this. Yep. And now we've got Elaine, excuse me. And uh, Elaine is uh, going to purchase a used RV and sell the one she has now. And she wants us or anybody out there to recommend an online site to research RVs by VIN number. I have uh, Googled and found several sites, but they all ask the uh, ask for, they want money to do this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, which I wouldn't mind, but I don't want to give my credit card number on uh, any of old website. So I'm wondering if you or any of your listeners know of a reputable site that can give me uh, that kind of information. I'm interested in finding the history of a vehicle, accidents, and also estimated value. And uh, just thanking us and that she okay. enjoys the podcast. Um, well, um, Elaine. You're absolutely right. There are so many sites out there that are what we call uh, pay for play use. They will lure you in, say, check out any VIN, VIN number, enter it here and get the complete history. And you do that, you type in that great big long number and then they want to get your credit card. They want you to get a membership. They want to charge you a fee. Uh, don't, don't, just walk away from those. Um, now, most of the places that I'm going to offer, there's three of them, three sites that are free. And many of those sites just repurpose the free information anyway and try and talk you into paying for it. But the first, the best is, is, is called vehiclehistory.com, all one word. We'll put links to this in the show notes. Vehiclehistory.com is a very comprehensive resource from the National Highway Safe, Traffic, Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, and it gives uh, recall information, uh, your VIN check will uh, let you know if this has ever been subject to a, a total loss insurance claim. Um, it tracks vehicles by VIN number, including RVs, uh, all different types of RVs. Um, most uh, vehicle um, dealerships rely on NHTSA for all of their information. And um, what I, another thing I like about it is it'll also show you on that vehicle whether there's any open recalls that have not been repaired, which is a really good thing. So that's one, uh, vehiclehistory.com. Uh, the second one is uh, the, um, it's called the, it's the, it's from the National Insurance Crime Bureau and it's called the NICB VINCHECK database. Uh, and that will tell you whether that vehicle that you think about buying has been stolen, whether it's ever been salvaged as a total loss uh, by an insurance company. Uh, and that is a really a valuable piece of information to have. Uh, it's quick, it's very easy. Uh, I think you'll find that, that, that it, it really will help you learn real easy. And um, uh, then there, so it's the NICB, it's the, um, and it hit NHTSA, I can't remember all these initials, the NICB VIN check, uh, NHTSA recall database, and vehiclehistory.com. I'll put links to all of them. You just go to the show notes at rvlifestyle.com, uh, look under podcasts, and, and you'll see it out there, and we will have it there for you. So handy stuff, and particularly for those of you who are trying to buy a used uh, RV or truck or whatever the vehicle might be, get that VIN number. Exactly. All right, we covered a lot of material here. What do you got for us next week? What do you want us to talk about? It's your show. Send us your comments, your questions, Mike and Jen at rvlifestyle.com, and we'll be back next week, next Wednesday, with more. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Happy trails. <laughs>